Okay. Um, uh, Robert McConnell, R O B E R T M C, capital C O N N E L L. Great. And um, so when you do the interview, if you could make eye contact with me, these guys, um, if you are looking back and forth, which is tempting to do because I know you do presentations to large groups of people, um, it looks really kind of odd um, on the film. <laughs> yeah, well, thank dark you dark. for that because uh, sure. I saw myself in a recent film and I was doing that constantly uh -huh. and I really look like a shady character. I, it does! That's <laughs> what I tell people. I said it looks really disturbing when your eyes are flitting back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> well good. Okay. So, um, and could you tell me what your job is here at uh, New York Drive? Uh, the title is Heritage Preservation Officer but it covers um, cultural resources and ground disturbance and a whole host of other things that we probably don't have time for. Okay. Sounds like a whole other interview though. It sounds like it would be It could be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. So um, where were you during... Uh, oh, and if also if you could answer questions in complete sentences because we're going to cut me out of the film. So um, if I say, where were you during the 1964 flood, if you could answer, during the 1964 flood I was... and then say where you were at. Okay. Where were you at during the okay. 1964 flood? Uh, during the 1964 flood, I was at home in Hoopa. I was a sophomore in high school. And, um, you know, I don't have a whole bunch of real direct memories of, of the, the water. Um, we, I had to stay at home. Um, we were totally cut off from almost everywhere and, and uh, there was basically no place to travel to. Uh, we couldn't get anywhere for almost 10 days. And is your family Yurok? No, I'm, I'm Yurok, my mother's Yurok, uh, I'm married to a Hoopa. And um, so I've heard that over a hundred homes were destroyed in Hoopa. I couldn't say yes or no, but I know it was extensive. Uh, in, you know, I, again, I, I didn't get to travel out much until uh, much later, and um, also, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that that happened. I, I've seen photographs. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, do, do you remember, like, what the weather was like kind of leading up to the flood? I mean, I'm sure, like, you know, we've all lived well, in Humboldt County for a long time. It's well, a lot of rain. Well, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the days prior to um, the rain, there was actually a pretty heavy rain, uh, snowstorm, uh, followed by this really warm, I guess they call it now a pineapple express that came in and melted that snow build up in just a matter of hours. Uh, I also recall that it was real heavy rain, um, but you know, uh, being that young, I wasn't paying much attention other than um, it was raining. And what was it like for you as a school child? Did school, I imagine, was canceled? Um, it, it was for a short time. Uh, I guess what I remember from going back to school was, again, I was a sophomore. I, uh, I was playing on the basketball team, and uh, uh, one of our trips after the roads got restored was to travel to Crescent City. Uh, it became uh, uh, an overnight trip and we had to ferry across the Klamath River where um, the, the old highway, well it's old highway now, uh, the bridge had washed out there and I remember going down, uh, walking down the hill to a ferry and crossing the river on a ferry and then getting on another bus and going up to Crescent, spending the night um, playing basketball and coming home. Long trip, it sounds like. Yeah, it was. Uh, I guess the other distinct memory I have was um, right about Stone Lagoon. There was, uh, I was leaning up against the window in the bus and I looked up and there was uh, a bull elk above the road with one horn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's just the thing that stood out to me on the, the road trip.
Now, um, I've talked to um, other people about how the flood affected Yurok people. Mm -hmm. um, one person told us about their family property up along the river that um, really helped to sustain their own family and other families in the Klamath community, that they would bring food down, they, would, um, they had big orchards, they had animals, so they brought food down for their own family, but they also shared with other people in the community. And that during the flood, they, um, their property was washed away. They lost you know, the structures on the property, but also lost the property itself. And it really, for them, changed their whole life. I mean, for the whole, you know, future of their their family and their and their friends. Have, did you hear? Have you talked to other people who have had that experience? Um, I, I think um, what I can recall directly was that um, um, there there was a, a, a an effort by community members to uh, go around to different households. We, we were lucky enough to have a freezer. Um, my mom canned a lot of foods. And uh, so we were able to live off of that as well as th there was um, quite a number of people in our household that uh, our brothers, sisters, I I'm one of eight. And uh, we also, I also had at that time, I think five nephews and nieces. And uh, so, uh, that effort, I, I recall the, there was two gentlemen would come every three days or so and, and recharge our freeze, freeze everything. So we survived fairly well. Um, and I, you know, I think my parents probably shared as much as they could. And, but we were um, located well away from any flood damage or uh, what property um, we were related to. Uh, Downriver from here, about five miles, is way above the floodplain, so we didn't get any direct effects of that. But I, I know that there's a number of accounts of of uh, properties washing away from from that flood event. Um, one of the things you brought up the, about the canning that has mm -hmm. come up repeatedly in stories from people, and we've kind of like you know when you start working on a film, you think you know what the story is. And then as you go and you ask people questions, you kind of discover the story. And one of the things that we that we think we've figured out about the story is that we think that the people of this area of Northern uh, California, of Humboldt and Del Norte counties, fared probably better than people in, in urban areas because of their, um, their skills. Like they were fishermen, they were farmers, they were, um, people worked in the timber industry. They were used to um, being creative problem solvers and fixing things, like you couldn't just go into town and get something. The people, you know, a lot of people canned, preserved food. Um, so what do you think about that? Do you think people in this region uh, fare better because they seem to be maybe more self-sufficient, can't just run into town every time you need, you know, something? Or what are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely people here are, are uh, um, one, they're more resilient than I think most people in, in uh, urban areas. But the, um, the uh, storage of food uh, was always important in that um, we don't have supermarkets to go to and didn't. And if you look back at that era 50 years ago, uh, we just barely had a, a phone in our house. Uh, television was black and white and three channels. Uh, the uh, we didn't have uh, it, it, um, inside uh, plumbing. Uh, we had to go outside. Uh, certainly people were more uh, used to being able to take care of themselves. Uh, we supplied all of our own firewood. We never, well to this day we do that, but um, canning is, is still something that um, goes on in, in my family and um, we've passed it on to our children and when we get uh, fish in particular um, they're going into jars and uh, we eat, eat fish uh, probably more than your average bear and uh, we can our, our deer meat. Uh, freezing food is, is good but it's second best to canning it uh, by a long ways and, and we also uh, tend to um, grow gardens and, and uh, can the surplus off of that. 
so yeah I think so we're uh, we're just that way um, used to doing for ourselves do people still teach uh, do moms and grandmas still teach children how to can and how to um, preserve food yeah um, we're yes right now my wife and I are, are picking cherries um, we just started last night and uh, we have a, a great niece that's living with us she's eight years old and uh, she said it was her best dinner ever and all we had was cherries. <laughs> that sounds like my dream dinner. <laughs> I love cherries. Uh, well, uh, they turn out they're real good for gout, which I have, and uh, so um, they're doubly important this year than, than they were last year at this time. That's good information because our guy who isn't here today has gout so, and he's suffering from it today, so we'll have to take that back to him and tell him to eat, start eat, eating those cherries. Eat cherries. And sweet cherries, right? Yeah, and, and stay away from cauliflower, fried foods, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he probably knows all the rest of them, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see, so one of the things that somebody else was telling me was um, that there were changes, like, um, because a lot of Yurok people lost their homes, that many of the Yurok people moved into Hoopa, did things change that way, that, like, maybe changed things kind of permanently for the people? I think it probably did have an effect like that. I, you know, I can't uh, say yay or nay that more people moved to Hoopa, uh, but um, there's never been a great deal of, of um, employment on the Yurok Reservation. We have very few places where there's flat ground. Um, we're sitting on a hillside here. Um, the, the few places that are river terraces uh, are, are flood prone and uh, you can't build on them so um, you know we're, we're only now starting to bring uh, infrastructure back to the Yurok reservation the electricity uh, it was non-existent uh, three miles down the river from here uh, five years ago telephones um, are only recently being installed also um, it's only been in the last two years that people have landlines here cell phone service doesn't happen except for right here around this office um, you know all those things they, they just they're not here and haven't been and do you think I mean I just don't know people people have asked like well what if a flood of this magnitude happened today what what do you think would happen in this community well, I think it would fare a little bit better in that um, the bridges wouldn't wash out uh, like they did back then. Uh, Martin's Ferry Bridge is in its seventh reincarnation right now, and I think this one will withstand a, a, a 1964 flood event. I also believe that the, the bridge at Klamath would withstand a 64 flood. Um, the communities uh, down there, uh, Klamath Glen, for instance, is is safe or diked off, has a levee. Excuse me. Um, maybe there, there, well, there would be a lot of uh, um, houses impacted uh, on the, well, they'd be on the north side of the river, but on the south side of Highway 101, all of that would most likely be heavily impacted. All those campgrounds, residences um, that are right by the, um, well, after you cross the, the Highway 101 bridge, uh, it would be on your left. Um, all of those would probably be highly affected. But um, overall, I think people are a little bit better prepared. We, we do have that in our, our memories. And um, gosh, a 64 flood event. Uh, I'm dealing with um, trying to decide if, if a river bar that's about a mile up from here is uh, in the flood plain. And the last time it was uh, underwater was in 1964. So are we talking, uh, what is the 64 flood? Is it a thousand year flood? Is it a 500-year flood? Uh, certainly not a 100-year flood. Uh, I don't know, but we're trying to make that determination. And I'm, 
uh, struggling to find any direction um, on that. Yeah, that was one of the things that came up um, when we were talking to the people from the Na uh, National Weather Service was that idea about, you know, 100 year, 500 year, 1,000 year flood and mm -hmm. what does that mean? And, and basically what he was saying is a 1,000 year flood means that you have a 1 in a 1,000 chance of it happening any given year. It was like, wow, I hadn't quite thought of it that way. <laughs> I, you know, I thought, you know, we've already had one. Now, you know, we've got a good 999 years to go. But it's, it's really that the, your odds are, you know... Well, um, um, but, you know, I, I understand that the 55 flood was a 100-year flood, and we've had at least three of those in my lifetime, so... Um, what was uh, the other one that you had in your lifetime? You, so you had the 55 to 64... Well, there was um, 1970 or 73 was, was pretty big. Uh, 1997, I think 2003. Um, there's probably a couple more in there that um, I'm I'm not really tracking on, but yeah. it, it seems like almost well not every time you turn around, but there's some pretty extensive water coming down the rivers, and and, and sometimes it's from waters in the upper reaches coming down. Uh, one of the last ones was water right here bringing the water levels up high and uh, it didn't flood from way up river so there's kind of different ways of, of it happening yeah. uh, the national weather service used a term for the 64 flood they say it was an atmospheric river and so you imagine in you know this river of water just coming through and just absolutely dumping on this area well it it was also um uh, had a huge snowpack that that atmospheric river I, I i thought it was the pineapple connection yeah um, it's called that too that so, warmth yeah um the 1955 flood occurred on december 21st just like the 64 did the others have been kind of into january which uh, maybe is a little bit different i, I think our our seasonalities have, have started to change too over the last few years we're we're getting a a lot of different uh, effects from uh, climate change, uh, I, I'm told. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I you, believe it. When you had the floods more recently, how did the community react and kind of communicate with each other about what needed to be done to kind of help each other out? Well, uh, you know, we've, we've got a little bit better infrastructure. In, in, in uh, Prior to 1993, there was no Yurok tribe. It was... Uh, Yurok people, but no tribe. And since that time, we've organized, we've uh, began to get infrastructure. This building was only, it's only four, 15 years old right now. Uh, the Klamath offices are, are maybe 11 years old. Um, we've worked to get uh, power downriver, uh, telephone service. We're um, developing a, a, a roads department. We have our own forestry program. We've got a wildlands fire crew. We've got a watershed uh, department. We've got an environmental um, protection um, program. So uh, th those things are instrumental in our abilities to react. We're developing a, um, um, a, a drought plan because of the drought where um, trying to look at ways to store water uh, so that uh, in the event of a, a wildfire we've got water on hand instead of just drawing it from the river or, or creeks like you would most most years. Um, there, there's all and I think people are, are better off in terms of um, their living conditions and their abilities to um, survive. We, we've got solar um, power to houses that don't have electricity. Uh, some have um, uh, micro hydro. Uh, others uh, have um, electric generators for, for standby. Uh, I even have an electric gener for, for generator for standby. I, forget the year but it wasn't that long ago that um, 
we had uh, a lot of, of um, wet weather. I think it was in February. It d didn't produce a flood, but it knocked out the power. And, and we lose power two, three, four times a year from wind events, um, uh, a lot of water soaking the hillsides, trees falling across power lines, different things like that. Even uh, car accidents taking out the power. No, those, those are all um, things that people are better prepared for uh, just because of that infrastructure and, and being able to provide for themselves. It seems like a small community too. Um, people kind of know each other, so um, if something happens, can check on each other pretty easily, know who's like older, maybe needs, you know, we worry about like if she's without power, you know, we can go check on her. Well, uh, absolutely. I think though um, the ability or that type of uh, thought process is, is something that's um, uh, culturally inherent in that we try to care for our elders and uh, take care of those that have less and um, always try to uh, pick somebody up if they need help. Those are um, things that you, you learn um, uh, as a native person and, and you know being a small community is, is a part of that but uh, we, we have a, a, a cultural system that, that looks out for each other. That's good. Well, That's absolutely. Good. Yep. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, any other questions, you guys? Thanks. Bob, you mentioned uh, someone came around and helped you recharge your freezer. Oh, Would yeah. That, that intrigued father? me. Whose father? Gordon. Gordon who? Um, actually, there, there was a n guy by the name of Cooney Downs, and I forget the guy that was with him, but uh, Cooney is, is a Yurok that's passed on. Uh, he, he taught me how to um, uh, mend um, our, our um, fishing nets. And um, you know, the second time I went back, he said, this is the last time I'm going to show you. And uh, so I had to remember at that time. <laughs> he only gave me that that uh, that second opportunity um, I, I said earlier I don't have direct stories of, of um, things that happen but I, I do want to pass on that uh, my oldest brother uh, well oldest surviving brother at, well, not too long ago he passed away but um, he was um, attending trade school in the Bay Area and he had to travel back down there. He had brought his family up to Orleans. His wife is from Orleans and he had brought them up there, taken them up there for the Christmas holidays. And he had to go back down there for a reason I don't recall, but um, he decided that he, he knew that the weather was coming and, and things were getting bad but he decided to come home and he was traveling on 299 he got as far as Junction City and um, the bridge there was washed out well <clears throat> um, that was on December 21st he managed to walk from there to Orleans in 10 days and uh, if you can imagine walking that distance right now, um, it'd probably take a few days. But can you imagine walking that distance knowing that um, there was few bridges left? Um, the Hoopa Bridge survived, the one right here survived, but um, bridges that were crossing creeks like Hostler Creek and, and, and Mill Creek had severe damage to where they weren't passable. Uh, Bluff Creek totally blew out. The, where, where the creek is at now, um, it was mountain. And uh, the creek followed what's now Aikens Creek down and went into the Klamath River in 64. It blew out where that bridge is. And it took him three days to get around Bluff Creek. He ended up having to walk clear up and around the headwaters of Bluff Creek in the snow 
to get home. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Trees down everywhere. Oh, yeah. Um, on the way, um, there was mudslides, uh, raging creeks to get across. In one of the mudslides, um, they pulled a man out. Uh, he, he had a traveling companion. I don't know who it was, but they met each other. Uh, people helped them all along the way. Somebody would say, well, take my car and go as far as you can. So they'd get two or three miles, and then um, they would park the car and continue on. Um, someplace up, up above um, Willow Creek, there was this mudslide, and as they approached it, they saw somebody being swept along in it, and they were able to pull this individual out. I don't know who that individual was, and I don't know who was his traveling companion, but um, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and I guess the other one I was going to tell you about, I already did when uh, we drove up to Crescent to play basketball. Um, but outside of that, I don't have any real, well, no, wait a minute, I'll take that back. I remember the caribou helicopters and, and um, them bringing in supplies. And I uh, remember the, um, there was aluminum water cans about this big around and about this tall that they brought in potable water for people. Um, but that's, that's it for, for memories, direct memories anyway. You know, one of the things that I heard, um, and the reason that I wanted to see if I could interview uh, Thomas O'Rourke was mm. um, this: these stories of parents who went into town to maybe buy gifts for the mm. holidays, and they got stuck in town, and the kids were all home together. And I'd heard that about Thomas O'Rourke's family, that he and, his, and the other children in the family were caught on this side so all the children were together, which is fine for a day or two, but little did they know this big you know, flood was going to happen and the parents were caught on the other side. Well, um, I, I recall his sister telling me about that, um, but I guess for, for my family, um, uh, my oldest sister, who's still, still surviving, w lived in Orleans, and uh, our great uncle managed a, a walnut orchard and she had uh, made a deal with him to pick and process his walnuts and uh, so she and um, the sister that's between her and I uh, had taken the last uh, group of those walnuts, processed walnuts, to Eureka to sell them for Christmas money. And she got stranded over there. And, um, well, the two of them got stranded over there. Our grandmother lived over there, so they, they had a place to stay. Uh, but their kids were, um, her kids were staying with um, my family. And so uh, I, I guess the other one I remember is stringing popcorn for uh, Christmas uh, ornaments. Um, a side story to the walnut thing was there was uh, part of that walnuts was to go back to um, my, our great uncle and they were stored in a garage in Orleans that got flooded. So those walnuts got dispersed out and you can walk this river corridor and find walnut trees growing all along um, on in the f uh, where the flood was. And I've always wondered where that come from. And last summer, my sister told us that story at our family reunion. So, aha, that's where the walnuts come from. That's a great story. It's kind of like the Johnny Appleseed of the walnut tree. I guess so, yeah. Well, that, you know, there's, they're, they're not doing that well, but there's walnut trees all along this river corridor and I was always puzzled as to why, and now I know. Yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. Um, anything else, Michael? Anything you'd like no, to I add? I don't have any questions. Great. Well, those were interesting stories. I really well, appreciate it. Thank you. It. Thank you. Anything else, Ted? Well, let's go ahead and do the... Uh, oh, okay. We have to do 30 seconds of silence. But before we do that, I just want to ask a question. 
how did they recharge the freezers? I don't understand. Oh, they that. they brought around a, a, a gas electric generator, and um, they would plug it in and get it to where the freezer shut off. And sometimes it take three four hours, and then they would unplug it and go to the next one. And they went around everybody's house and did that. Because yeah. now I know what I'm going to do with my generator and my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to count off 30 seconds. Start now. You know what? It goes by really quickly when you're falling out of an airplane. I'll bet it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have you talk about your... Yeah. Well, um, uh, um, all right, what was that thought I just had? About 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, uh, that's one of, it's one of the things that happens when you get to my age. I, I just had my 65th birthday, so... Um, Things just go and they disappear. It'll come to me pretty soon, but it'll be too late by then. That's good that it comes back to you. Sometimes they don't even come back to me. They oh. just leave and that was that. <laughs> well, keep looking at Jennifer, but tell us about that 30 seconds of... Yeah, tell me about well, that. Well, um, that right, didn't... Set the story. Yeah. Well, my wife is... Um, her birthday is 11 days before mine. She is Taurus and I'm Gemini. And... Uh, she and I were talking about our bucket list and her bucket list had jumping out of an airplane. And so um, her kids learned about this and they said, okay, mom, for your birthday, let's go do it. And so we ended up a weekend and a half ago, uh, two, two weekends ago up in central Oregon at a place called Creswell and um, Went through the two-minute training, got strapped in. It, there's not much to it. You sit here, you do this. Um, you hold your hands like this, uh, and um, they'll tell you to look at the camera and smile. And when that happens, they go one, two, three, and you jump out, and you're supposed to go like this and arch your head back. but I'm looking down and um, they're pulling my head back and telling me to look at the little camera on their hand. Um, but that 30 seconds just went by so fast. It definitely was not that long that you just had. And um, then they go like this in front of your face and they pull the chute and everything. Well, the noise is just loud, loud, loud like you don't expect. Um, and then they pull the cord and you go and everything is just quiet. It's quieter than it is right here and you're kind of just floating along. They let you um, stir the chute and you go in a couple of circles and then you come in and land on your butt and it's over and it just seems like it's that quick. So my question is when you pull the chute it always looks like you almost like stop. Pretty much feels Does like it that. feel like you stop? Well, um, you don't feel that. It's, it's like um, you don't feel the 30 degrees that it is outside when you jump. Um, you, um, I mean, I had t on a t-shirt and um, it didn't feel cold. Uh, it, you know, that 30 seconds went by so fast that it was like, whoa, that was 30 seconds. And then the <coughs> parachute uh, ride down takes three to four minutes and it seemed like it was two minutes. It just all went by so fast. You don't have a, any shot at being scared. The one, <coughs> one thing that, well, the two things that you're not prepared for is the sound and then what your face is going to look like at 120 miles. Uh, with, yeah. <laughs> 
you develop some amazing flaps in your skin. <laughs> And then uh, maybe the third thing you're not prepared for is how hard your wife laughs when she's looking at your pictures. <laughs> There's even a video of her on out there on Facebook laughing so hard that, yeah. <laughs> so she did this too. You guys. Oh yeah, we were in the same plane. Um, I I went first and she was right behind me, and we got to uh, wave at each other as we were going down. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. What else is on your bucket list? Um, we both want to travel a bit. I'm. <clears throat> my dad always wanted to go to Alaska. He wanted to go up there to shoot a brown bear. I just want to go up there to take pictures of him and catch fish. Uh, we want to go to the Grand Canyon and walk out on that um, Hualapai, whatever it's called, that bridge. And, um, you know, just... Um, those, are, those are good things to have on the bucket list. Those yeah, yeah. Um, nothing extraordinary, I don't think. A lot of people say they can't jump out of an airplane, but I think you'd be surprised at what you can do. So you know the thing about um, walking on that glass uh, mm -hmm. walkway? Mm -hmm. Did you see on the news today that the one that they have that's outside of the building in New York, it cracked, mm -mm. it didn't break, the people didn't fall through, but they were standing on it, and the glass shattered in it. Luckily, they've got some good... I shouldn't have told him that, huh? That was, like, bad. No, nah, that, that won't walk, stop right? either one of us. Are you pretty good with heights? You must be good uh, with heights. You jumped out of an airplane. I am a former tree climber, and um, I started that out at a really early age, too. Um, but I I can climb trees, and I did it for a living in one of my former lives. Okay. Yeah, but you guys can't use any of this other stuff. Okay. I don't care well, what, we can give what, it to you. what what you what I signed there. You can't use after that thirty seconds. No, but we can give it to you. Do you want it? Sure, I yeah, guess. Yeah, we could just give you that video, and you could yeah. give it to your kids or whatever. You know, just well, pass it on. And I guess. Let them know what your bucket list is. Well, that's it's, it's probably a lot longer than that. We really didn't do a formal one. Uh, we just were talking about things we wanted to do, and she said that, and uh, kids got wind of it, and so. We check that one off. Now we got to go and check off another one. Do it twice. <laughs> Be careful what you tell your children. I guess is the bottom uh, Absolutely, line. they were finding that out. And then, be careful about who's got a video over there when your wife's looking at your pictures. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it didn't, get, it didn't go on YouTube, did it? Um, I don't know if it has or not, but um, I, I'm I'm about ready to. I uh, let my almost daughter-in-law know that she's really sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> and that payback. It goes on YouTube. Payback. Oh, it would. I'm sure it would cuz <laughs> my wife's got a laugh that if you ever hear it, you could pick her out of a crowd anywhere. Uh-huh. Uh not that it's um uh anything um mean about that statement. It's just she's a very distinctive got a very distinctive laugh. And then she was laughing so hard she could hardly breathe. She one of those infectious people where yeah, she starts laughing and then everybody else starts laughing. There you go. Laughing. Yeah. yeah. Our son was over here laughing at her, and then our daughter was over there laughing at her. 